Hello, everyone. Welcome. We'll give everyone just a sec to come on in and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and I will just let everybody know that uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, this is part of our series for the 2020 Old Line State Summit, or as we're calling it this year, the Online State Summit. Um, and thank you so much to our speakers for being with us today. Uh, today's session um, is about retrofitting the suburbs, and I think it's going to be a really interesting and um, and hopefully thought provoking discussion. And my name is Jessica Felt. I'm the Preservation Initiatives Manager here at Preservation Maryland. Um, so we just have a little bit of housekeeping before I get to our speakers. Um, so this is, like I said, this is part of our ongoing uh, webinar series um, in lieu of our in-person Old Line State Summit. Um, so we do have a, our website, preservationmaryland.org. We have uh, links to our past um, sessions as well as information on upcoming sessions. So I do hope you will check that out. I also want to take a moment to thank our sponsors for their support of this program. Whiting Turner, the Maryland Historical Trust, Worcester Eisenbrandt, uh, Brennan and Company, and the Middendorf Foundation. Our sponsors, along with support from members and donors, have made it possible for us to present these um, sessions free of charge. And we really do appreciate and want to thank everyone for their support. Um, so today's session, we have both some people that are in the preservation field and some people that are not in the preservation field. Um, and we're going to be taking a look at the issues of um, American suburbs, which are coming online to be 50 years old and um, both the challenges and the opportunities that come with um, these being potential new historic districts. Uh, so we will start with Casey Anderson, chair of the Montgomery County Planning Board. Uh, next, we'll have Dan Reed and Evan Goldman. Uh, Dan Reed is an urban planner and freelance writing, writer who is also, also the author of the blog, Just Up the Pike. Uh, Evan Goldman is the Vice President of Acquisition and Development at EYA LLC. And finally, we'll hear from Sheila Bashiri. Sheila is the Preservation Planner for Rockville, Maryland. And again, thank you so much to all of our panelists for being here, here to explore these topics. Um, so I think the last little bit of housekeeping before we go ahead and get into the uh, meat of the session is uh, to let you know how you can ask questions because we really do want your questions and we have time at the end allotted uh, to ask questions. Um, at any point in the presentation, you can type your question into the question box. Um, and that's even if you have um, something that's come up and you need some help with this or anything like that. We're not tech, but maybe I can help you with that too. But um, uh, just please go ahead and put a question in the question box. Um, and then at the end of the session, I'll go through and I'll ask the panelists um, the questions that are from there. Um, if we run out of time and can't get to everyone's questions, um, I do like to uh, share the questions we didn't get to the panelists to see if they can um, maybe help you out afterwards and um, we'll email you those answers. Um, so without further ado, we are going to hand this over um, to Dan Reed, uh, who is going to uh, we'll start us off with Casey, but um, I'm going to hand it over to Dan. Um, so give me one moment. This is a new skill for us, so bear with us. And I, so this is Evan. I think for the first presentation, Dan and Casey and I are kind of all kind of talk from the same slide, so it'll be more of a conversation than a presentation per se. That sounds great. All right, this little full screen going on here. All right. So Dan, do you want to, Dan or Casey, do one of you guys want to do kind of a broad overview or you want me to, or what would you guys like? Go ahead, Evan. Yeah, we can, we can each talk through the slides that we, we do together and jump in where needed. Okay, perfect. So, uh, so hello everybody. I'm Evan Goldman um, from EYA. <laughs> And uh, we, we build uh, residential, multifamily, um, townhome communities all around the region and often do master planning. So we all like uh, we all wear our planners ha planner hats as well as our developer hats. Um, and so with the topic today of, you know, what's going to happen with these, uh, you know, kind of suburban um, neighborhoods that are reaching 50 years old, um, generally suburban neighborhoods outside the Beltway. We thought we'd start by just sharing some slides of historic districts that exist today in the region, um, both truly urban ones, um, as you're seeing here with Georgetown. And we'll go through a, a series of slides from truly urban to more suburban um, and then start probing some questions about what that means for um, some of the suburban districts that are outside the Beltway. 
So with that, I will start with this slide. And the idea here would be for any of the panelists, Sheila, Casey, and Dan, to kind of interrupt, get their thoughts, and talk um, through this. But we threw Georgetown down here as an example, because uh, it's probably one of, you know, other than Old Town, probably the most well-known historic district in the region, um, with buildings that date back to the 1600s and 1700s, um, with, with both residential character as well as commercial character that's been very well preserved. Um, and even on the bottom right, what you're seeing is new construction of projects that fit in within the existing um, fabric of that community. Um, and of course, the canal itself um, pictured on the bottom left. And so clearly has architectural significance. It clearly has an urban street form um, that is significant. It was a retail uh, area that is um, significant to the city and remains so. And then there's just a ton of history going back within Georgetown over the years. Um, and, and some of that history is good and some of that history is not great um, from a social equity perspective. Uh, but these images kind of evoke the sense of what Georgetown Historic District is all about. Uh, Dan or Casey, if any, or Sheila, any thoughts on that? Oh, well, well yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so then moving out to Chevy Chase, um, which is obviously a little bit further afield, developed later, uh, kind of 1800s, early 1900s, um, one of the first true streetcar suburbs um, along one of the streetcar lines going up Connecticut Avenue. Um, beautiful architecturally significant homes um, on you know manicured streets, very attractive neighborhood, um, historic. Uh, it has obviously this historic district as well. Um, this is a neighborhood that doesn't have a particularly great past, you know, a neighborhood where the original houses, um, you generally had to be, well, you had to be white to live in these houses. And so um, there's a, a history here of a neighborhood that was created that is beautiful, um, but that also celebrated a really bad part of our past history as a country. Um, some of the redeeming qualities of this neighborhood, of course, are um, you know beautiful full growth trees, street grids, sidewalks, the ability for the neighborhood to connect, um, garages that are either in the alley in the back um, of the houses or don't exist. And so you get street life on the front lawns um, instead of driveways and generally walkable to things like retail, walkable to schools, um, walkable to parks and amenities. And as, as Evan pointed out, you know, these many of the communities that we cherish the more historical parts of our region were also heavily segregated places, right? Uh, between racial covenants that explicitly said you could not purchase a home in these communities if you were not white, and in some cases, if you were not um, like Western European or, or Christian. Uh, there were requirements for the size of home you had to build, the price of home, the materials of the home that dictated, you know, both certain level of architectural standards, but also made them cost prohibitive. Uh, zoning that required minimum lot sizes that meant you had to afford a large property to buy a home there. Um, and it creates, you know, uh, a really mixed legacy. If you look at ads for some of these neighborhoods and they were being built in the early 20th century, um, some of them were very explicit about being discriminatory places and others, you know, refer to things like protected community or, or covenants in place uh, that implied that, you know, the way this place was designed and in, in turn the demographics of this place were going to stay the same. And it really, it, it raises some questions about when we talk about protecting historic districts today, you know, which part of that which part of that legacy are we trying to keep? Because in many cases, um, even though covenants are illegal uh, and housing discrimination is, is, is technically no longer allowed, you know, the, the, these communities have basically been locked in as places where affluent and mostly white people live. Right. Uh, which yeah, brings up- I, I think that uh, when you start getting into Chevy Chase as opposed to Georgetown, and, and then some of the images like what you're seeing here, these more suburban contexts, I think the tension becomes more apparent um, with the path forward to try to make some of these communities more inclusive because almost by definition, any effort to make Chevy Chase more socioeconomically or racially for that matter, diverse, is going to have to involve uh, housing types that are different than what has been there in the past. It'll be a more intensive form of development, even if only moderately so, but new new structures of a different type, different typical sizes and foot, building footprints, 
And so the question will become not so much can we preserve the structures that are there now, but how can you fit in something in addition to that in order to make a transition to a neighborhood that accommodates a broader range of people and lifestyle choices and incomes as well as races? And that, that brings us to some of the newer historic districts that we're going to talk about today. Um, like Evan said, these are communities that are primarily outside the Bellway uh, that were developed in the middle uh, of the 20th century uh, and became historic districts in some cases because of really iconic architecture. Uh, a lot of these neighborhoods were, were in the mid-century modern style. Hammond Wood is one example uh, near Wheaton. It was designed by Charles M. Goodman, who was one of the region's most prolific and, and, and famous um, mid-century uh, architects. And there are a number of developments like this. Um, Rock Creek Woods in Kensington, uh, Holland Hills in Alexandria, and Carter Rock Springs in Bethesda, which I'm gonna let Evan talk about a little bit. Yeah, and so Carter Rock Springs in, in Bethesda, Similar, I mean, you can see just from the pictures of the houses, they are within the neighborhood. The houses have a similar look and, and feel, but they do have they have unique features. It's a little bit different than kind of some of the cookie cutter suburban developments that you've seen in the region. Um, beautiful landscape lots, generally large lots, full growth trees. Um, but from an urban perspective, um, you know, this was designed in a day where everything you did, you had to do by the car. So there are there are no sidewalks or very limited sidewalks to the extent there are. You can see in this image, you know, a, a truck um, driving with a woman in a, pushing a stroller right behind it without sidewalks in the middle of the street. Um, and so there's a, a social or a, I'd say a um, social construct um, assumed by this type of development in that everybody owns at least one car, if not two or three, um, that everybody drives for all their errands, um, that they drive to take their kids to school, they drive to take their kids to go to work. Um, and so it, it's a, um, given where we are with the environment and given where we are with traffic issues in the region over time, um, has this propagated a concept that's really good for us as a society and something we should be preserving? Or are there ways to figure out how to make these communities over time become more mixed use and um, better from an environmental perspective? Yeah. And, and while a lot of these historic districts were named, you know, whilst many of these historic districts were, were done because of their architectural merit, um, some of them seem to have a, a slightly more questionable provenance. Um, this is Springbrook, which is a historic district off of New Hampshire Avenue uh, near White Oak. And this, this historic district consists of about 12 houses. And if you look at the, um, the, the report from the State Historical Trust as to like how, why this is historic, um, it basically says the homes are old. They date to the early part of the 20th century. Uh, it admits that the homes are fairly traditional and simple in style. Uh, and it notes that they are on large lots. And the further you dig into it, you know, the reasoning behind the historic district becomes clear. The lieutenant governor at the time, this is in 1976, lived there, uh, mm -hmm. which, you know, makes you wonder, like, is this historic district really intended to preserve something that is architecturally significant or a significant place or an iconic place like Georgetown? Or is it simply for, uh, you know, important people to just keep what's around them looking the same? I mean, one of the, the, the most surprising things about the Springbrook Historic District is that there actually is a famous, you know, historical landmark next to it, the Rachel Carson House, where, where she wrote the book Silent Spring and started the environmental movement, but it's not physically within the historic district. I mean, to say, I mean, in, and so the, the question that we've been grappling with, you know, before we came to this conversation today uh, is that a lot of the suburbs in Montgomery County and across Maryland are, are reaching that 50 year mark uh, where they are eligible for, I guess, nat national historic designation, right, uh, as well as local historic designation. And so the questions we're going to start to confront is what kind of place you should qualify for that? Yeah, and this and this slide is, you know, a neighborhood I picked having been the developer that that um, con you know conceived and built the Pike and Rose project at Old Georgetown Road and Rockville Pike, um, which you know Dan was involved from a community outreach perspective, and Casey was the planning board chair, I believe, during the vote for the site plans and was involved as well. Um, you know that's a mixed use project that's only about two miles from this old farm community, which is a standard, very typical suburban community you'd see. Um, even though that is true that it is standard, when it was built, it was largely white you know, largely um, often people fleeing the city. 
of DC um, when this was built in um, uh, kind of post-war. But large lots, um, you know, houses that vary from colonials to split levels, nothing particularly exciting about the architecture. Um, the trees have now fully grown in, so many of the streets are beautiful and pleasant. There are sidewalks. There is a school that you can walk to, but really nothing else, um, or I guess a park. And so the question is, you know, what about this would be something that should be preserved, and how do you, and should it be preserved? How would you preserve it? And then how do you preserve an essence of something while still allowing um, other parts of of um, kind of the the change in the way that we're starting to live to seep in? And I I will tell you one funny story. I live in Adams Morgan downtown with three kids. Uh, we live in a historic district in a historically protected house, um, and you know, a block from a beautiful park where we would go play with our kids. And I remember uh, a friend of ours who lives in this district, when we would drive out here, my kids would see the playgrounds or, or I should say the play equipment in people's backyards and say, wow, everyone has their own playground. And yeah. so, you know, from a social, from a social perspective, right, is that the right way to bring community together for everyone to be mowing their own lawn, for everyone to have a playground, for everyone to have their own open space instead of open space that's joined together? And is that something we should be celebrating or something we should say, we made some mistakes from a planning perspective. Let's learn from that and move on. Yeah, and in commercial districts, you know, parking lots are the are the major issue. I think we've uh, and you know we've reviewed a couple of uh, cases recently in downtown Silver Spring involving the uh, intersection of Georgia and Colesville uh, near the old uh, Silver Theater, and I don't think anybody would dispute that the theater and that shopping center um have some very important uh features that qualify for historic preservation and it is it is designated but the question is does that mean that the parking lot has to remain a parking lot even if it's necessary to preserve the the building envelope and its relationship to the street and where the parking used to be i would argue that doesn't necessarily mean that we should consider the parking lot as a parking lot to be part of the historic setting. Yeah, so I think we only have two more slides, right? I think so. Um, so, you know, we talked about a higher end neighborhood like Old Farm in a pretty wealthy community, but would suburbs like this qualify for historic designation? This is called Randolph Hills. These are, you know, what you might call like Levittown style houses. They're, they're fairly small. They're built after World War II for returning veterans. There are literally thousands of, of homes like this, not tens of thousands in Montgomery County. But you know, there are uh, you know, indicative of a very specific time in American history and a very specific style of house that was you know, intended to provide mass housing for a lot of people. Do these communities qualify for his like do these com communities qualify for historic designation today? Should they? Right? Um, what was what was interesting about those two communities is one is if you, the White Flint Metro, one is two miles to the west, one is two miles to the east. The one to the west with the larger lots and the bigger homes that was largely white is in the Walter Johnson School District. The one on the east side, literally on the other side of the tracks, is in the Wheaton School District. And so different economics, different population, similar time period of construction, you know, how do you decide what gets preserved and what doesn't? Yeah, and there are a lot of good things to, to like about these communities, right? Uh, many people do have a strong sense of community and an orientation to that place. Uh, a lot of these neighborhoods where there were large enough tracts of land that they could be designed in such a way that people could walk to parks and schools and community pools, which are a big part of Montgomery County suburban culture. Uh, they've developed a mature tree canopy over the past 50 years. Uh, and, you know, architecturally, a lot of these communities were laid out in a way that followed the contours of the land. Um, so, at when it is done well, you can create a pretty awesome um, intersection between the built environment and the natural environment. At the same time, uh, a lot of these neighborhoods were not designed for walking, even when they had sidewalks. Uh, the homes weren't always built to last. Uh, and you're seeing now that a lot of these communities uh, require, you know, a lot of the homes in these neighborhoods require a lot of upkeep. Uh, these neighborhoods were generally segregated by use, income, and race because of zoning uh, that, you know, not only mandated residential uses but certain lot sizes and like detached houses uh, as evan mentioned there wasn't a lot there these places weren't designed for a lot of social interaction and they're auto dependent um you know which which again raises the question of like which what parts of these places do we want to hold on to 
Um, and that question is going to keep coming up over and over again as that threshold for historic designation shifts, right? Like this year, things built in 1970 are now eligible for historic designation. You know, should we designate communities like this one on the left here in Montgomery Village? It is, should this be eligible for historic designation? Should big planned communities like Montgomery Village new towns be designated? Uh, what about shopping malls? which are turning 50 Montgomery Mall is 50 years old this year, or what, a couple years ago. What about office parks? Uh, and, and what about my house? <laughs> my house was built in 1988. It, it's, it's, this is a picture of it on the right. It's vaguely modern. It has a cool little courtyard design. Uh, it's surrounded by uh, more, uh, traditional houses, so it's kind of an outlier where it is in Silver Spring. Um, these, you know, these might sound like outlandish um, premise, but uh, these are the kind of questions that I think are, are worth exploring because, you know, our, our built heritage uh, includes all of this stuff uh, and it's worth interrogating why, why they're valuable. So, all right. Yeah, and I, I, if I could just jump in on that last point, I think it's not just a question of what is a particular neighborhood uh, important to preserve, at least in some way, some manner or is a particular structure worth preserving or does it qualify under the under the law as being eligible for designation but how to how to it's not just about adaptive reuse it's about how to assess the context uh of what makes it historic or what it gives it the qualities that we'd want to preserve while also allowing for change and i think we've we've touched on a couple of them one is about racial, social, and economic integration, and the need for new housing types like missing middle. If somebody wants to put a duplex or or build a detached garage with an apartment above it. Is that going to be prohibited because it's part of the historic setting of the yard of the of the house, or it's not consistent with the character of the of the neighborhood, uh, all the way up to you know a small apartment building, which used to be pretty routine. Um, the other part is something Evan kind of touched on, the idea that a lot of these neighborhoods were so auto-oriented. And in combination with environmental regulation, you know, we have parts of the county where there are strict limits on impervious surface. So uh, a combination of historic uh, designations or rustic road designations and limits on impervious cover mean that you can't build a sidewalk. And some of these neighborhoods now have a lot more traffic than they did when they were out in the, I mean, they used to be the countryside. Now they're fully and really embraced within a more suburban context, if not an urban one. And people need to be able to cross the street. They, their kids have no safe place to walk outside of their cul-de-sac to the school that might be just uh, you know a short distance away. And how can we provide safe access to things like bus stops? I was riding my bike on Briggs Cheney Road uh, last week, just as an experiment, just uh, to the west of, of 29. And it was a harrowing experience, even though I'm somebody who doesn't really mind riding my bike with cars. But I saw uh, coming the other direction, a woman is pushing a baby stroller uh, on the shoulder of Briggs Cheney Road, because there's no sidewalks uh, and the cars are going by at 50 miles an hour. And that wasn't an historic neighborhood, but I think it's an example of how the combination of restrictions that are adopted in order to preserve a historical cultural resource, character of a neighborhood, the environmental uh, management, and and things that we've done over time to try to uh, protect green cover and limit stormwater. In combination, they can lock in a pattern that is not healthy or sustainable for human beings or the natural environment. So I'm going to be coming at this at a totally different point of view based on what I've done in the past, you know, where, where I've worked on in the past and based on working in Birmingham, I mean, I'm sorry, in um, Rockville now. Um, my name is Sheila Bashiri and I'm the historic preservation planner for the city of Rockville. And I'm actually from, let me back this up a couple of pictures. Do I have control of this? Uh, yes, we Sheila, can. let me, uh, yes, you can back that up a couple. Okay. And I don't know how. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Here, let me. But anyway, uh, 
give me one second and I'll get back to the front. Okay. Anyway, I was gonna say, um, I've been here in Rockville for just over six years. I'm from the city of Detroit. I was born and raised there. I worked for the city of Detroit um, for just over five years as a historic preservation planner, also as an architectural historian. So doing a lot of research, I came across a lot of those covenants that said only Caucasians can live here. And the home that I was born and raised in, my parents purchased it in 1955. And it had that covenant on it. So actually they couldn't get an FHA loan. So they ended up, the owner of the house actually gave them the loan and they paid him until the laws changed in 1968. And that's a big part of the problem of segregation is that it was done by law. A lot of times these homes couldn't be purchased by someone who wasn't Caucasian. They could be Jewish or anything else. They had to be Caucasian in order to purchase these homes. And I came across this so much in doing research in the city of Detroit. But um, I worked also for the city of Birmingham, Michigan, which is a outer, outer ring suburb of Detroit, um, very affluent. I worked there for 10 years. And this was a city that put a lot of effort into creating an area, they call themselves the walkable city, and they put a lot of effort into making themselves a walkable city. You know, being near Detroit, everything is car oriented, you know, so we always had sidewalks on both sides of the street, and so that was never a problem, but public transportation is always a problem, because the auto companies always worked hard to make sure there was no public transportation, so everybody had to purchase a car, and so that's still the case today, and it's really difficult to get around if you're um, in Detroit and trying to get into a suburb to work or whatever like that. There's just limited bus lines that go there. And so that's always been an issue. But when I worked for the city of Birmingham, they put a lot of effort into making it very walkable. Um, their 2016 comprehensive plan, this was a big part of it. So if, um, for example, if you were doing development in the city of Birmingham, you were required to, particularly downtown areas, you were required to do um, upgrades as far as sidewalks, you had to widen them. Uh, where they would, might be four feet wide, they were widened to six feet wide so people could pass each other and people could ride their you know bikes through there. They had bike lanes, they improved those. They had benches on the street and so, and, and curb cuts. So if you were to uh, try to develop a building in Birmingham, and it's pretty built out, so you were a lot of times redevelopment, but you had to do these improvements, and people did them because Birmingham was a, a desirable zip code, and so they would do it in order to be able to have their business there. The streets were um, bike lanes, they had double sidewalks on residential streets. Uh, it was narrowed down so that it was easier, it was calming for the traffic, but also easier for pedestrians. And that was really important for the city of Birmingham. One of the things about working in Birmingham was that um, property values were very high. I mean, extremely high. And they had a lot of post-war houses. There were very small, uh, one story, two bedroom, one bath, one and a half bath. And people yeah. actually would um, purchase these homes or developers would purchase them and either take off the roof and put on a second story or tear them down completely to build a Bigfoot. And the city started making controls as far as the Bigfoot goes so that they would fit into the neighborhood still. But one of the things when I worked there for 10 years, I was not allowed to designate one property. And the reason for that is, is that property values were so high that um, people that were inheriting these properties didn't want their property designated because they knew that they could sell it to the developer for way more than it was worth. And also um, the city knew that, you know, this is tax revenue when you're, you're building a house and, you know, this is money for us. So they would not allow me to designate a property in the city of Birmingham. It's maintained a lot of its character, but that was a big issue. And so then when I get here to Birmingham, I mean to Rockville, Rockville has like your West End historic district. It's um, you know, well, Rockville being the county seat, it was uh, designated the county seat in 1776. So we have a lot of houses that range in, you know, late 1700s and, and forward. And so one of the historic districts that we have has mostly homes that range from late 1700s to the, um, maybe to the early 1940s. But still, you know, we have uh, not 
as walkable. You know, the, most of the streets have one sidewalk on one side of the street. The other side of the street is, is you know, um, grass out to the, to the edge of the road. Um, the sidewalks that are there, they're three feet wide. So, you know, particularly now, you know, social distancing, you can't pass anyone on the street and have any kind of space between you. So a lot of times if you're walking on the street and someone's coming down the street, you actually have to step out into the street to let them pass. So there's these things where it's it's really different here. And also the thing about Rockville is, is that unlike other cities, we don't have that 50 year requirement. Um, they stopped that in 2009, I think this, they changed the ordinance so that if you had a property that was built in the 60s, 70s, for example, where I live at here, I'm in a condominium called uh, Americana con um, Condominium, Americana Center Condominiums, built in 1971. And we are designated as historic. And we were designated in 2015. And um, there are certain criteria that would make you historic. And one of the things here is, is that when urban renewal came through in the city of, of Rockville and they tore down the downtown, uh, this is one of the first buildings to go up. And then they built their um, town center and you know tore down black neighborhoods in order to do this. But they built the town center and then it was like underground um, concrete wall and people didn't like it. So they tore it up and they built, you know, if you've been to Rockville, you've seen what the town center looks like now. So they tore down most of the buildings that they built. And this is one of the last buildings standing from urban renewal. Not only that, um, with all the criteria that we had, it met many of the criteria in order to be designated. So we don't just base our criteria on architectural. It's also based on um, historic significance and cultural significance. So um, the streets here are car oriented. People have been very resistant to, resistant to having bike lanes and things like that because they're always worried about, you know, we need more room for cars. And so it makes it very difficult. But I'm coming at this from a different point of view because of the historic neighborhoods that are traditionally black. And a lot of times those are the neighborhoods that get looked over. People don't pay attention to them because they don't have those buildings like you would have in other neighborhoods that have such the architectural beauty and significance that you're saying, oh yeah, we gotta designate these. In Rockville, we have criteria that we look at. We have actually nine criteria that we look at and part of those are architectural and design, but other parts of those are our heritage and cultural significance and, and um, what it meant to Rockville's history, to the community's history, to the Montgomery County or to the uh, state or the country. And so we look at those things. We um, have your post 1940s neighborhoods, but a lot of them have lost their culture already because people have come through and torn down a lot of the small, you know, they were just plain Cape Cod houses and they've come through and torn them down. The Cape Cod houses, like, let me see, if, can I back this one up? I, I'm going to go ahead and um, see if I can back that up previously. There you go. Okay, there we go. So these are Cape Cod style houses. You would find these all over Rockville because a lot of times um, they were just built as parts of developments and they were built and then sold. And so they were all the same style. And so now when you look at the post 1940s neighborhoods, a lot of those have had additions added to them or they've been torn down and one and a half or two story houses have been built. And so a lot of the neighborhoods have lost their context. So it's like if we had a bunch of those, they would make a great historic district because they tell a story about, you know, this was developed during this period of time. Uh, post World War II, and we needed more housing because soldiers were coming home, and there was a shortage of housing. So these developments were built in order to make room for these uh, soldiers that were returning home. But this particular house is part of a historic district that is African American, very small, very small historic district. And the district itself, it was originally uh, owned. The property was owned by a free black named Samuel Martin, and he actually had a large area. And these areas were actually over time passed down to relatives and then sold off in lots. But this was called a uh, kinship community because these homes, a lot of times when African-Americans owned property that was you know, a large amount of property, their relatives would actually end up building a home on that property. There would be enough room so that there would be relatives living on the property. And so it becomes a kinship community. Uh, with Martin's Lane, these houses were actually sold into developments to the point 
where there was just one big lot left. And when I say big, I mean a large lot. It was about um, 1.41 acres of a lot that was left. And so this was the house that was on it. The rear of this lot goes way back. And this house was built in 1941. Um, this is the house, the picture of it in 1948. The um, owners that purchased it were the Hebrons, and they purchased it in 1941 and built the house. And then as their income grew, as you know, they were kind of prominent in, in the community, but as their income grew, you can see how they added on to the house. And this is actually culturally shows how African American communities grow, how um, wealth adds on to their property and how it makes changes in their property. So where this is not, you know, anything special for African American community, it does have a a history and a, a culture and a heritage that we don't get when we look at the other neighborhoods because we're not looking at those. We're looking at the beauty of the houses. So with this one, uh, it was empty. It was sitting empty for a long time. The owners that have it now, they purchased it to tear it down because it was such a big lot. They wanted it subdivided because they were going to build more uh, houses behind it. And when the owner purchased it, we have a rule or a law in Rockville that Every single building that gets a um, that when you put in for application for a demolition permit has to go through an evaluation of significance, evaluation of historic significance. And they've been doing this for a long time because they found they were losing a lot of their buildings. So no matter what the building looks like, commercial or residential, it has to go through the significance. And we have to research it to find out if someone important lived there, someone who was active in, in Rockville, important to the city. And so. Um, this particular one, they decided they would designate it because it did tell a story about this particular community. And it was the last property left in Martin's Lane that still had its original configuration. So they actually decided to designate it. Mayor and council decided to designate it. And this is difficult for a developer when they purchase a property and all of a sudden they go through this and find out they can't tear down the property because all of a sudden it's designated. But this particular owner, um, at first, this was a disappointment, but the owner had purchased the property because he wanted to build three houses on that lot for him and his daughter and his son and their families. And so basically a kinship community, but the daughter fell in love with the house, fell in love with the story of the history of the property. They ended up, you know, redoing the house. They had, it structurally was in bad shape. They were allowed to subdivide the property and now there's three houses on this property. And it's back to being a kinship community because the, daughter, he lives, the owner lives in one um, house and the son lives in another and the daughter lives in this house. So, you know, you can see where history came full circle and they're white actually, but they feel very comfortable in this neighborhood. It's this African-American neighborhood and there's still historic homes in this neighborhood. But this turned out to be something that um, it wasn't based on the beauty, but based on the history of the property. And then we have, um, so can we go forward here? Can I go forward one? I don't know if I'm doing it right here. Okay, here we go. We have Lincoln Park subdivision. And Lincoln Park was actually subdivided for African-Americans. It was subdivided in 1891, and it was meant to be a neighborhood for African-Americans. Uh, there's a second section of Lincoln Park that was uh, platted in 1926. And it's one of the few subdivisions in the city of Rockville that allowed African Americans to live in it. But it was near roads, it was um, straight shot down to DC and people started moving into the community because they were getting government jobs and it was easy access to the um, to Washington DC and easy access to Rockville Pike to get there. So uh, with this particular neighborhood, a lot of the people that live there grew up there and they're still living there. So this really is a community that has stayed close knit. But over the years, people have purchased homes, um, torn them down to build new homes. And these are developers. These are people that don't live in the neighborhood. They're just buying them in order to make money. And a lot of times when young people, this is true of my own home and my community, when a lot of times when young people um, inherit these homes and they grow up and they move away, they don't want these homes. So either they will abandon them or they'll sell them for real cheap just to get them off of their hands and the developers will buy them and you know build Bigfoots. And so that's what's been happening to Lincoln Park. Lincoln Park is um, 
originally, they looked at designation, historic designation for the whole community, and they decided they didn't want to do that because they didn't want to be limited in what they could do with the properties. So in not doing that, they lost a lot of the uh, context or the contextual feel of their neighborhood. And so what was left a lot of homes like this one. So a developer actually purchased this house because um, he wanted to tear it down and build a new house. But once he uh, purchased it and we did the evaluation of significance, actually community people came and came forward because we recommended, I recommended um, they could be torn down, but the uh, community came forward and they said that the person that originally built this house and they built it in 1931, I believe it was, that he was very prominent in the community, that he had lived in this house, he and his family lived in this house for 50 years, and they had done so much for the community. They um, had, you know, actually moved houses into the areas because they were going to be torn down and people needed places to live. And so he was just very, very prominent in the community. And we looked at our criteria, and he didn't meet the criteria. The house, actually, is really nothing special. You know, it's... Um, two-story house that, that just, you know, it's just nothing special. But this particular community has just had so much loss, they decided they wanted to have this as part of their history. The city agreed and they did designate the property. Um, so the developer ended up, you know, being stuck with the house. So he has actually gone on to actually uh, improve the house and he's getting ready to build an addition on the rear. And that's one thing we've been very lenient as far as additions go on the rear in order to make these homes livable. Because a lot of times if you expect it to keep the exact same design and style, people can't live in them because because they were built for, you know, 1930s living and we're living in, you know, another century. So uh, we make it easier for people to actually add additions. We always say it has to go on to the rear. Um, this is another street where there's just one side walk on one side of the street and it's still difficult. And that's a big part of Rockville all over, but a lot of Rockville is easy to get to transit. It's easy to get to a bus or easy to get to the um, metro. So that makes it a little bit easier as far as getting around. Can we get to the next slide here? Yeah, I think it's working. <laughs> here, I'll uh, try on my okay. end here. Sorry about that. Okay. Should pop up for you in a second. Okay. It's funny. It worked fine when we were practicing. <laughs> I know. Of course. I know. <laughs> okay. So this house here, we call it the mystery house. It's sitting in a huge lot. It's a, a half acre site. And it's the industrial behind it. It's just sitting there all by itself. And it's just been sitting there for years. And it's one of those places that it's a tiny, tiny house. And you drive down the street, it's on um, North Horner's Lane. And you dive, drive down the street and you're like, what is that little building sitting there? It's just been sitting there empty forever. And it's sitting there all by itself. And so the people that own the property, um, they decided that they were, you know, there's actually three lots there and they actually combined them. They decided they wanted to tear down the little house so that they can put their in, like, industrial business there. And so when they came for the evaluation of significance and I had to do the research, you know, I had to go back and find who built the house, you know, who they were in the city. There was very, very little information for me on this property. And so um, I was able to find the original owner, but nothing you know, was available really to tell me anything about the property who owned it or anything. So I did ask the community organization if anyone knew anything about this house, how I got there. And it's really sitting across the street from Lincoln Park subdivision. Uh, it was once Montgomery County. Now it's in Rockville, but it's still not in Lincoln Park, but it's directly across the street from it. But once I asked someone in the community, the next thing I knew, I had someone contact me and they showed me that this was a book about this little house. And they had actually the family members, they call it the forgotten man because they don't know a lot about the actual person that built it, but they knew it was a relative. And the Hawkins family is populated throughout Lincoln Park area. Across the street from this little house is Lincoln Park Cemetery, which is full of descendants, relatives of the person that built this house, whose name um, was Hillary Hawkins, was who owned the land. His son, Hazel Hawkins, actually built the house. But Hillary Hawkins, in doing the research, 
we found out that he was born between 1850 and 1857. And that's the one thing about African-American records. A lot of times you can't pinpoint things because the records are so sparse. A lot of times they don't give you all the details, but we did find out that he was built during, I mean, he was born during slavery and actually lived through the Civil War. And as an African-American man, he actually purchased this property in 1921 for $10. So he had this huge lot. He lived in Lincoln Park, but he had this huge lot. And at one point he built a two-bedroom house on there and he lived there. His family members, I believe he had two wives. The second wife died in 2000, I mean, 1920. And they believe it was from the uh, Spanish flu, you know, that was going on still from um, 1918. They said, carried on for two years and they believe that's how she died. But uh, he had a lot of children between the two wives. And so there's still a lot of descendants that uh, lived in Lincoln Park. And so, so little was known about him, but he died in 1939 and his son built this house in 1946 and they lived there for quite a while. And so um, one of the things that we found is that, you know, this is what makes this culturally important to Lincoln Park, whereas the Architecture is nothing special. You can see how it once looked when uh, someone lived there. So it was special to the family enough for them to try to research their history and um, write a story about it and put a history. Because the whole book is about descendants of this particular person, of Hillary Hawkins, and their, you know, their prominence as far as Lincoln Park goes and how they helped populate the area and you know what they did. But the fact that is a lot of times. People would say that's nothing tear it down it doesn't have any beauty to it there's nothing special about it you know we need this land so when we actually put this forward to the owner and let him know that we had found a lot about this history of this house and the people that owned it and we were looking at designating it he withdrew from actually tearing it down he decided that he wanted to wait and see what he wanted to do with it because we suggested we don't want to keep him from having use of his land we didn't want to use lose this house and we thought about is there a chance that maybe it's so tiny maybe we could move it because it's very much intact this concrete box with stucco on it and it's very much intact it's still original wood windows and everything so we thought about is there a way we, we can maybe move it over to the cemetery or move it over into uh, lincoln park community center which has a big park across from it and so we're still kind of looking at that but he hasn't come back to us to let us know what he wants to do um, as far as he's not going forward with going with this project. And he's owned this land for years, so we figured that he's not in a hurry to develop the project property. But it's one of those things where it would have been lost and where it's important history. But just looking at it, that would not have told the story. So it's one thing that we want to be able to keep in mind those things as far as African-American communities. They get lost in the process because they don't have the things that the white communities would have. But this was the only place that you know African Americans could live in the city of Rockville. Um, if we can get to, if I can get to the next slide. Yeah, apologies, it seems that there's a bit of a delay, so it's coming up. If you okay. want to get uh, started on the story of it, it should come up. Okay. Any anyway, um, the next slide I wanted to show you is actually Rockville's historic district it's the west montgomery avenue historic district and these are homes built in the late 1870s up until the early 1940s it was um designated in 1974. uh so you can see the types of homes that are in this community but these are homes that african americans could not live in because you know they had the covenants on the property and um this just wasn't for them so that's why they had their other communities that they could live in a lot of times people um had slaves and they actually um, would give them property. And that's how some of these communities came about from the property that they gave. But um, we have the post-World War houses that are outside the historic district. And a lot of those have been torn down and people have been building a large homes. Because this is a desirable area to be in. Um, there's only one sidewalk on, on the one side of the street mostly. Um, this is West Montgomery Avenue that we're looking at down here. This is Jefferson, West Jefferson. They run into each other. But you can see the quality of the homes and and just what they show. But one of the things is is that oh, and this is a neighbor once again has been resistant to bike lanes. They've complained about traffic coming through. They've tried to find ways to stop through traffic on their streets. Uh, they don't want you know anyone coming into their community so much so that um, we have an area called Chestnut Lodge, which is a historic building, a historic district 
but it's a historic building that was once a uh, sanitarium. And I'm trying to get to the next slide if, if it'll move. But anyway, it's a sanitarium. And at first it was called Woodlawn Hotel. And back in the 1800s, this was a place that people came from DC to do their uh, summers in this hotel. And so it was very famous then. It was, I believe 19, let's see. Yeah, 1889 was when it was constructed. So you can see here, this is the uh, Woodlawn Hotel. And then eventually this was sold off in 1908, between 1908 and 1910, became Chestnut Lodge Sanitarium. And this became a very famous sanitarium for the experiments and the, and the changes that they made in, in as far as mental health and that type of thing. So it became a very famous building, but it was by 19, um, by 2001, it was empty. Um, 2005, it was purchased by someone who was going to actually redevelop the building itself and turn it into condominiums. But in the process, it took a long time. And by 2009, the building actually burned down. So they did not get a chance to redevelopment the redevelopment. So um, someone actually purchased the property and they were going to build six townhomes. They were actually three-story townhomes. They had garages on the rear um, and actually got this property zoned multifamily because it, you know, West End is basically the West End Historic District or the West Montgomery Historic District. It's like single family zoning. And that's always been one of those things that make properties exclusive so that you can't have multifamily housing in them and that keeps you from letting anyone else that's outside of uh, being able to afford a single family home. That's one of those things that excludes people from being able to get into a neighborhood. So this particular um, proposed Chestnut Lodge townhouses, these were million dollar townhouses that were you know, six million dollar townhouses that were going to go in the neighborhood. And you can see that they were sensitive in the design that they tried to make it look similar to Chestnut Lodge originally. And it doesn't really, when you look at it, you don't immediately get affected that these are townhouses. But the neighborhood totally opposed these townhouses because they were next to their single family homes. They didn't want people that couldn't afford to be in their single family homes. But even though these were million dollar townhouses, they didn't want them coming into your neighborhoods. And some of their houses in that particular area are not million dollar homes. But anyway, they opposed it to the point where they were going to sue the city for approving it because the Historic District Commission had to approve these as infill for that property. But the Historic District Commission found that they you know, actually were able to be here and they actually met requirements to be here, but the neighborhood didn't want them to get together and they were gonna sue the city for doing it. The actual developer was gonna sue the city for not allowing it since HTC had approved it. And finally, what happened is the city ended up buying the property and turned it into a park. And they turned it into what's called a passive park so that you can't go there and play, play ball. You can't go there and do all the different things you do. You can just go there and walk and it's sitting back there in an area with no parking. So people don't really know it's there except for the neighborhood. And so now it's almost like a private park in the neighborhood. But it's one of those things where so opposed to having multifamily homes, their thought is, is that we let in this one multifamily home next thing you know, lower income multifamily homes will come in the neighborhood. And I've noticed that even when there's um, apartment buildings being proposed that are not within their historic district, they come out and oppose them because they don't like the thought of different class of people coming into the community. And this is one of the things that keep people from being able to be in a historic district. Um, from being in these nicer neighborhoods, a lot of times they can't afford what's there and yet they can't move in. And I just came across an article my boss sent me that um, Cambridge, Massachusetts, they just turned their whole area so there's no more single family housing so that they can allow multifamily housing in any area of the city. And I just got this article from her, I think yesterday or day before yesterday. So this is just now happening, but it's their way of stopping this exclusionary uh, housing for people. But basically, this is just what I wanted to tell you. So that's why I say that Rockville is different in that they're looking at their uh, African-American communities different and, and, and designating them differently. But we still have that area of, of where there's exclusion and they can't get in. And this is one of those issues that we need to look at and we need to work with. The ADUs right now are, are a big issue and they don't want those in the neighborhood. So anyway, and any questions for me? Well, thank you so much. And um, I really appreciate everyone being here today and for kind of looking at it from all angles. And um, 
we do have a couple questions and please if you do have a question please um go ahead and uh enter that into the chat um one thing that i kind of wanted to get everyone's and i just as a little background for those of you who are not panelists um this group of panelists and i've had many sessions uh, over the summer and into the fall um and they've really been of just really thought provoking mm -hmm. for me and I think one of the things that I find so in interesting is, and especially something that um, I think that this topic goes to so many different kinds of preservation um, controversies and things that we have to grapple with. And that's, you know, both the role of, um, you know, we do have both high and low architectural styles. We have um, looking at some of the more complicated paths of some of our neighborhoods and um, how that can be made a, a bright future um, and how it can be a more inclusive, how places that were once uh, exclusionary can be made more inclusive. Um, and also uh, the thing of high and low styles. So these are not, as um, the, the slides from uh, Dan Casey and Evan alluded to, these are not all style buildings. These are um, places that you might look at and go, well, that's nothing, that, that's nothing special. But at the same time, um, you know, the preservationists do you want to make sure kind of instinct is to make sure that all styles are represented so i'd be curious um just to kind of uh go around and maybe say something about kind of that um i think it does go also to one of the questions we got which was about the intersection of placemaking along with these neighborhoods like is there um something uh something in there they were talking so the response the question was about um at the corner of georgia and colesville that was shown in the earlier presentation um so could that be something there's um a park present the buildings do some place making things to make it a more equitable uh a more equitable neighborhood with with um with more public uh benefit space so um just kind of any thoughts on on some of the um for me i think one of the things that's interesting is the the yes these the issues of how how do we kind of start maybe um working across the different fields to to make neighborhoods both equitable and um preserve preserve um what are unique styles i think the zoning issue is something that should be looked at you know as far as keeping single family single family it doesn't allow for anything else to go in there and part of the place making is, is to have areas within the community where you have your um maybe some multifamily but also some places for everybody spaces for everybody to use um within the libraries you know restaurants um just community centers things like that in order for place making in order for people to come together and feel like they're part of a community even though they live in different types of housing yeah. One thing I would like to see is is to see historic districts that are used more surgically, um, you know, as opposed to designating a, a large area in which you have people who, as, as Sheila pointed out, may not want to participate because of the costs uh, involved with maintaining their home to a certain standard, um, and also can exclude a lot of people from living in that community, uh, as opposed to, you know, you know, thinking about how historic buildings can be integrated into a larger whole and strategically selecting the buildings or sites that you know perhaps transcend their context and can you know i think uh, demonstrate architectural heritage without um you know covering a large area i mean one of my favorite examples of a historic district that i would like to exist but does not um is along georgia avenue in downtown silver spring there is a, two blocks of historic like 1920s era uh retail with with apartments or all mm -hmm. above this is georgia from wayne to fair maybe like i would love to see just the portion of those two blocks made a historic district because those those two blocks in many ways i think are very emblematic of silver springs history as a main street but also um add a lot of visual uh, interest to the place today, but, you know, are also kind of uh, anomalous with the context around them, which is, you know, been largely changed and no longer looks as it did in the 20s. But that's the kind of work I want to see 
because I think you get much more interesting places that way than something where everything is all from the same time period, whether it's from the 1900s or from today. Yeah, I'll bite on this. Uh, let me just say something that I hope will be provocative in a constructive way and not just in a less than entirely uh, helpful way. It seems to me that there is kind of, an, of a tendency for the people in a particular neighborhood to become the allies of historic preservationists, professional historic, preser historic preservation professionals, they're generally the types of people that are trying to stop change in their neighborhood. They don't want to see growth. They don't want to see development. They don't want more traffic. They, they are, in a word, uh, NIMBYs. And <laughs> the problem is that if that if when professional historic preservation folks take the, take the allies in the neighborhood as they find them, you wind up doing things like acquiring land for a park that nobody can use, like the example that Sheila gave in Rockville. Because in order to enlist the political support for historic preservation, you wind up making common cause with people that basically just don't want anything to change and don't and want to keep it keep keep it all like it is. And in some ways, that can be helpful if it means preserving a historic resource. It can also be harmful if it means excluding people of different income levels or races, or for that matter. Uh, funneling public resources into the acquisition of a property that nobody's allowed to touch. As the example Sheila gave, I think, illustrates very, very nicely. And, you know, I think that not being a historic preservation professional myself, coming at from the outside, I don't mean to sound hostile to the enterprise, but I think it's a fact that there, that when historic preservation professionals ally themselves with people whose motives are basically along the lines that Sheila described, it it damages the credibility of historic preservation. And that's a problem. And so I think that what Dan said is absolutely right, that if we go into you know, the, the process of trying to assess what should be preserved with the idea of how can we make sure that this is preserved, that what is essential to maintain you know preserving our heritage and the things that uh contribute to placemaking and add value add continued value to the neighborhood how can we do that while still accommodating growth and change as opposed to let's find whoever is with us on the proposition let's just designate this place in the hopes that we can make sure nothing ever changes that's more helpful and in fact necessary i think to to build a durable uh level of support for historic preservation in general and in particular in retrofitting some of these suburban places both commercial and residential that really do need to change although they also really do have historic qualities that are worthy of preservation and and that have continued value So while we were um, uh, talking, uh, we got kind of a clarification from the person with a comment on placemaking, um, which kind of goes to one of the things that sometimes these suburban neighborhoods, the significant, um, you know, it's a collect. So I, I think the the uh, questioner asked it really well. So the you know it's a collection of buildings which are collectively considered significant due to the place they make collectively together with their street layout to be historic and uh, do they lose that ability to tell their story when the context is diluted or obscured? Um, so any any thoughts on that? Um, it's a good point. I, this, this is Evan. Um, I think there are certainly places where the collection of buildings clearly warrant preservation. Many places. Um, I live in one of those neighborhoods where, you know, our neighborhood is is beautiful and I love it and I chose to live here. I bought a house here while it was already a historic district. Um, and there's places all around the country that are like that. Um, I think the harder part in the suburban context, which is really the focus of today, um, if we go to that place and we say, let's say, let's say you can only really preserve Old Farm, the feeling of what Old Farm is, the feeling of why people bought houses in Old Farm, like why they live there, why they love it, 
would be to preserve all of these, you know, quarter to half acre lot homes that were really only built to last 40 to 50 years and the street grid and the sidewalks and the street trees and all that at the potential without allowing for that ever to potentially transition to something else, because that's really the only way you could preserve that character. Um, I think we have to question that, right? We have to question what were the what were the goals at the time that that development was created? What were we going through? You know, we had racial issues and tensions in the cities. We had white people, wealthier people fleeing cities and buying suburban houses to essentially to get away from having to go to schools with black people. And so a lot of these communities that are wonderful, wonderful Montgomery County suburbs for wealthier people are from that. You know, that's why they were there. That's why they were built and that's who they served. And so we have to think about you know, did we create a system that was unjust in the time that probably should have been developed differently at the time, probably should have included affordable housing, probably should have included mixed up apartments within it, uh, probably should have included jobs for all levels of um, the socioeconomic strata. And, and that was a mistake. So let's not preserve that. But if there's examples of great post-war suburban communities that are mixed use, mixed racial, walkable, um create kind of the social fabric that really great old historic neighborhoods had we should 100 percent try to preserve those spaces as examples for what we can and should do going forward i think that's and i am not an anti-historic preservation as i said i live in a house that is historically preserved and i love i mean one of the things i love doing is traveling around the world and seeing beautiful historic cities and places um, i just want to make sure that it doesn't go to a place where we're preserving something that really shouldn't be preserved Um, so I think that, yeah, it's just kind of interesting because that what shouldn't be is such a broad question because there are so many, um, you can make an argument, I think, for for these places, you can make an argument against them. I think that's what makes it such an interesting, um, and I don't, I think one thing we've come out from all of our discussions is that none of us have really good answers to any of this, <laughs> um, but it's, it's something that, um, you know, certainly to keep in mind, I think it's important for everyone to keep in mind kind of all sides of the argument. And um, there's a question in here that's for you, Sheila, and I think I'd like to kind of tag onto it a little bit. So it's another preservation planner who's wondering about drumming up interest to start the process for an African-American historic district in their town. And yes. one thing that I'm finding interesting in this and I um, is that, you know, we do have you know, we think of the historic districts we've talked repeatedly about how some of these districts that we're talking about were based on racial exclusion, but also some of them, um, you know, we have, we do have examples of historic, you know, places and communities in the suburbs that were built as African American neighborhoods, and there is a rich history there. And, um, and, and so making sure that, um, or that um, you know, kind of drawing that red line saying, okay, drawing that red line saying, okay, no, um, in urban, uh, Suburban uh, preservation, preservation, but then what for some of the I lost the last part of you. I'm getting a double part of you. I'm getting a double voice here. Uh, sure. No, it's just, um, you know, it's, it is kind of the, the tricky thing is that, you know, some of these neighborhoods do have rich, a rich African American history. And um, I, one of the panelists in a, a presentation we did before said something that I've, I've kind of taken to heart, which is um, in Black history, as far as uh, this was more about planning and zoning, but it was about, um, you know, those communities are often the last that get to enjoy some of the benefits right. that white communities have long enjoyed. And so when you have these African-American suburban communities and you're thinking about um, making those as historic districts and building up support for that, um, you know, the, the kind of um, concerns that Evan and Casey um, have been, and Dan have been talking about, balancing that with this, okay, but this is a community that hasn't had a historically preserved historic district. Um, mm -hmm. and, and shouldn't they be able, shouldn't these, this history also be preserved in that way? I think that probably the way to start is, is to get people, you know, start going to community meetings and getting people to tell their story, the story of their family, how they ended up living there, um, who their uh, ancestors were, were, were their grandparents living there, is that the home that they came from, 
what types of things went on in this community in the past? You know, when was this started and, and why they ended up living there and the bonds that grew from them all living there together. A lot of times uh, they end up owning businesses and um, churches and even, you know, doctor's offices and things like that. Those things start to form as a result of them having to depend on each other. And so I think that first thing is to you know try to get the interest interest up by letting them know what a rich history they have and that there's ways to preserve it and then another thing is is like the architecture the buildings a lot of times they may not be fancy but they may have been built by someone in the neighborhood who got their brother and their cousins together and they you know went ahead and designed the house and they bought a, a um sears kit the first house that i showed you that's on martin's lane it was a Sears kit, started out as that, and then they, it grew. So there's different ways that these communities, these buildings started. And even that is a rich history because um, they had to make do with what they had and they made the most of it. And a lot of times these things, as I said, the income grows, the wealth grows, the home grows, the, um, the lifestyle grows. And so I think getting them to look back and see where they came from and how much progress they've made is a good way to get it started. Um, so this is kind of a question too, um, uh, that there's a lot of zoning. So it's kind of saying there's a lot of zoning laws out there on the books. It's not just historic districts that uh, support NIMBYism. So is there a bit of an unfair uh, scapegoating of historic districts and uh, preservation in the face of kind of the, the broader um, network of, of, uh, of preservation, uh, or I'm sorry, of, um, of zoning laws that are out there preventing the kind of um, changes that we've been discussing? So is the question, is historic preservation getting a bad rap? I think so, yes. <laughs> well, I guess if the point is that there are other things that prevent, you know, more socioeconomically integrated neighborhoods and construction of sidewalks. And and I think I mentioned one of them, which is environmental regulation, stormwater management in particular is preventing walkability of some of our communities. Um, but I don't think it's unfair to say that historic preservation plays a significant role here. Uh, we reviewed a project, a public project, not a private development project, about a month ago involving a sidewalk uh, in the Clarksburg Historic District, which is in northern Montgomery County. Um, a combination of the impervious surface limits, the uh, desire to protect tree canopy by our environmental staff, and historic preservation concerns including the need for an archaeological study that took two years, which found no significant, unearthed no significant uh, artifacts or anything that needed to be uh, physically preserved, but nonetheless took two years to conduct, resulted in a half mile of sidewalk that cost six and a half million dollars. Well, that's a problem, it's a huge problem. Because for six and a half million dollars, we could build six miles of sidewalk somewhere else in the county. And we're trying, we're desperately behind, we're decades behind in making our communities more walkable and looking out for the safety of pedestrians and bicyclists and, and others. We can't afford to spend six and a half million dollars on a half mile, half mile sidewalk. And while it's true that that particular decision was not solely the product of historic preservation concerns, it's a fact that the historic preservation was a, was a part of the reason that's a six and a half million dollar project that's taken multiple years to to build a, a what should be a straightforward piece of public infrastructure that I I think we should consider absolutely non-negotiable. And I guess that's what it boils down to is historic preservation, like some of the environmental laws, is a flat no. If you run into it and the answer is it must be preserved adaptive reuse notwithstanding, it has the power to bring everything to a screeching halt. That's not usually true of zoning laws, and the zoning laws are actually easier to change even when they're very restrictive. So I think it's not unfair to say that historic preservation really needs to needs to look inward at what its role is in these in the in the in the obstacles 
that we've been talking about here. Not to say that it's exclusively responsible, but I don't think it will do to say, well, look over there, there's some other problem, then go go talk to them and then come back to me. We all have to address all the pieces of this because we have an interlocking web of rules which were adopted for very good reasons that serve the public interest each in their own way, but when they're not balanced, they are devastating to the ability to produce more livable communities. And nobody wants that. And I think that's kind of different. Go ahead. I'll just add to that quickly, um, because I think there's some examples of how things have changed over the last decade um, that might be good lessons learned for the historic community. So, you know, 20 years ago, the development community and often the in-house planning folks were often at odds with the environmental community, often at odds with the affordable housing community in building new projects around in any parts of the country. And what we now find over the last decade is that most, because of really good advocacy work, many environmental organizations and many affordable housing advocates and organizations have recognized that the two go hand in hand, that you can't have more affordable housing without good development. You can't have better environmental regulations without better development. And so we now partner regularly throughout the county, often, quite frankly, changing zoning laws together. And that's become a great give and take. Um, I think the historic preservation community lags well behind that. And so that's one of the ways the historic preservation community could become even more relevant, quite frankly, would be to partner and say, okay, we recognize that it's not tenable for this entire 100 acre area of prime land to be preserved for only the rich. And so let's figure out what are the parts of that community, kind of like what Dan was saying, that really merit that preservation. What are the, the key houses? What are the key parts of the, of the jurisdiction or the area? And then what are the parts where we should be advocating for maybe similar architectural style, but more density, or we should be advocating for better environmental regulations because we care about the country and we care about the environment and we care about the world. And we don't just myopically care about something that's so tight. And by doing that, kind of expanding out beyond, what you'll find is many open and willing partners on the development side, which is probably very different from what that experience was like 30, 40, 50 years ago, because the development community has changed dramatically in that time period. Um, and there is much more partnership, there is much more alignment. So I think that's probably, to me, the way I would think about it. How do you become the advocates for the right things, and then through that process, probably preserve even more? And I was going to say, I think that this um, strictness of historic preservation varies from community to community, too. So where maybe one of those things where it's used to be restrictive in one community and another community, it may be one of those things, well, okay, yeah, I think we need this more than we need that. And so let's try to, you know, balance this out. Um, in Rockville, actually, anyone can actually put a house or a property up for designation. All they have to do is say, we want to, um, you know, designate this property and it goes through the process and they don't even have to be the owners. They have to let the owner know they're doing this, but they've used it to stop development, you know. And when I worked in the city of Detroit, we had a community of historic houses that were, <laughs> you want to say something, Casey? <laughs> Casey, I see you waving. <laughs> no, I'm good. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'll jump in. Okay, when I lived in Detroit, um, we had a historic district called Brush Park, and it had huge stone homes from the uh, late 1890s, early 1900s. And these were homes that, um, single family homes initially, and then when the automobile industry came in and people were moving up from the South and they were coming in from other countries to be able to work for the uh, industry, they started breaking these homes up into apartments. So um, eventually the quality of these homes started going down. Some of them were empty, some of them were occupied, some of them were crumbling, falling apart, and some of them were in beautiful shape. But um, it's near Tiger Stadium and Lions Stadium. And it was um, actually a neighborhood that they wanted to develop townhouses, work live homes there. And so with the homes that were historic, some of them were in, in shape that would they just needed to be torn down and some of them could be restored so the city made a deal with the development company that um you will tear down these homes and you can build on this land you will take these buildings you will restore them 
so that they can be viable businesses or homes or whatever. And so this turned out uh, to be a beautiful development as a result of the partnership that they developed as, a, you know, and meeting both of them had a need. Uh, the city had the need to get rid of some of these buildings and, and bring this neighborhood back up to where it should be. And the developers had a need to put in homes so that they could be right there at the stadiums. You can see some of the games from some of these homes that were built as a result of this. So I think that uh, depending from community to community, that's where it can either be too tight or loose. And like I said, when I worked for Birmingham, they had a historic district that they designated in like 1976, but they would not designate anything else because they, they did not want to lose the profit that came with that. And so um, they weren't real strict about historic preservation. They, they were very strict about you maintaining a, a building if you owned it. And there was never abandoned buildings. I think we had maybe one homeowner. And he didn't believe that if he didn't maintain the building that the city wasn't going to take it and do it and charge him for it. It started happening. All of a sudden, he started taking care of that building. But um, it's going to change. It's going to be different from city to city. And it's going to be a matter of trying to get the city to understand that they need to be able to work with other people at other places and sometimes a building that may need to come down a historic building may need to come down for the better good and in rockville we don't have that in our ordinance but in detroit we actually had that in our ordinance it was you know for the better good for the city as opposed to just that this was a historic building and it couldn't come, come down um so i think the last thing i know we're almost out of time so we've got a couple um uh, questions. One one just came in that I might have to get to you um, at the very end, um, but uh, I'd kind of like to leave it here because there's been some discussion of building partnerships and building um, building your allies, which I think is interesting as far as as this. And so something um, the first kind of comment was just about the density of laws here. Sometimes you have local laws, sometimes you have federal laws, sometimes you have state laws, and there's just um so many uh so many kind of layers out there um and to me this tied into another question about ensuring that if you do build multifamily housing in a historic district how do you make sure that it's affordable and to me these two things are all uh intertwined in building allies because i think um one of our challenges and we discuss this in other sessions as part of this is um making the all of this less complex and bringing more awareness of what is on the books and, and kind of what the systems we're working in are. Um, and But then the other thing uh, piece to me too is then, okay, then how do you make sure that um, the changes you're making are supportive of some of these uh, more broader broader goals um, that we've been discussing here? Um, and how, so then I guess the ally building towards those those common goals. Any thought? <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. Yeah, I would just say this. I think I think what I've seen in my you know 20 some odd years, 25 years doing this, is um, I think groups that don't often interact enough are suspicious of each other and assume the other's intent. And um, especially at least in my generation of developers, you know, there aren't many people I know that aren't excited by the idea of having some built-in placemaking or beauty in a project that comes with the nature of it being historic in some way. Um, you know, we built a project Robinson Landing on the old Washington Post um, factory down in Old Town Alexandria. And during our excavation, we found three Revolutionary War era ships, like unbelievable. It cost a fortune, I mean, millions and millions of dollars worth of preservation, delayed the project for 14 months. But it was also one of the most exciting things that any of us had ever been engaged in. I mean, we literally uncovered the ships and could see them and could get close to them and were preserving that history in partnership with the city. And, you know, I've had other projects where you'll tie up a site for acquisitions and there's some really cool, interesting detail, an art deco detail in a building or a front facade that just really is just it captures what you want to build there. And those are some of the most exciting projects that you do because you have the ability to actually have authenticity in what you're building. Um, and so where I think the partnerships often can happen is what I think sometimes happens is there's a fear that if I go in to meet with some historic folks that the knee jerk is going to be, uh oh, now I can't develop anything. And mm -hmm. the question is, how do you preserve, as I said, the appropriate details, the appropriate pieces of that project so that you can build something new and maybe it is mixed income housing, maybe it is you know something else. 
um, that then accentuates the beauty of that history and tells the story for a long, long period of time. And I think we, if we can get rid of the suspicion and we can go into on both sides, mine, I'm guilty of it as well, and go in together as partners and be flexible, I think there's a greater good that can come out of that. And you probably would see more districts being open to a historic preservation status if they felt like there was some permissivity and um, or uh, some flexibility long term. And I always like to think that historic preservation or historic district is a lot more lenient than a gated community. You know, you can do way more in a historic district than you can yeah. in your gated community. Yeah. Yeah, I feel similarly, it's a great point. We've never built a gated community in our 27 year history, because, partly because exactly what you just said, and you're dead on, right? Like some of these communities that were created that do not have any flexibility are, um, you know, are equally, problematic. Well, thank you guys so much. I want to make sure we wrap up um, right on time. I know Dan has to be somewhere at four. So I really appreciate um, you guys coming in and giving us all a lot of food for thought. And um, thank you to everyone who's attended. Um, we will be sending out an email in the next day or so um, with a recap as well as a link to the video um, that was of this session. So Thank you guys so much. I really, really appreciate it. And um, I will see you all hopefully at our next session. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Go on, guys. Bye.